So Lazar saw a test flight. And one of the, uh, like, of course, if you're going to make this thing up, there's loads of stuff that he says. I mean, there's like proof uh, that from my point of view that there's something in Lazar's story. OK, we'll come to that in a minute. But one of the things he said is that in the test flight, the thing kind of like like went uh, kind of turned onto its belly. So it rose up the this, um, the flying saucer. It, it rose up like levitated, but then it turned on its belly to start moving around. And you think that's like really weird that you would say that, you know, like if you're making it up, why on earth are you got, getting this thing to turn on its belly? But then the gimbal video does very something very similar, you know, it kind of rotates 90 degrees, okay? So and then you think of the Tic Tac video, then you think of the fact that um, George Knapp and, oh my God, I'm talking about George Knapp again, um, <laughs> Bob Lazar, and George Knapp was there actually, Bob Lazar and um, Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp and David Fravor met up because they were all doing a UFO um, conference together. And Fravor and Lazar met and spoke. And Fravor, you know, thinks, well, okay, you know, he's like, he's not insane, you know. I tried to find an actual quote for him, but he, I didn't. So I paraphrased terribly. But, you know, there's the, the something that tells me something, okay. And I know that, you know, Jeremy Corbell released the photograph of all of them and Jeremy Corbell has got a film to send you but I think that if you're interested in Bazaar Bazaar <laughs> uh, um, Lazar then watch Corbell's film like it's a good film it gives you the basics of of what's going on it gets a bit kind of cloak and dagger with the element 115 but apparently Lazar says that he's got a bit of the element element 115 and Nap has seen the elephant 115. <laughs> so um, anyway, but it does say something to me that um, Fravor and and Lazar have spoken and that, you know, there's something in it from um, Fravor's point of view. I think that's fair to say that Fravor hasn't come out, Fravor hasn't come out and said, you know, this is all a load of old nonsense. So that kind of, you know, makes sense to me. And if you just like see in your own eyes, like the Tic Tac video, it certainly fits, um, you know, like at least potentially that might be a way that they are uh, propelling the Tic Tac around using the um, anti-gravitational propeller thing. Propellant, what's the word? I'll just say engine again. The anti-gravitational engine, yeah? So that, that's very interesting, isn't it? Now, here is a lovely bit of detail that um, that Lazar has said in one of the interviews, which is linked. Not too sure which one. But this is about a candle. Now, this is... Uh, I have put in the episode links, although I'm not kind of using any of the audio, um, the, the Rogan interview, because I think that that's a, you know, a kind of landmark bit of this whole story. And I've also put in the Corbell film, of course, like, you know, if you're interested in Lazar, then of course you've got to watch the Corbell film, you know? And um, that is a landmark moment as well. So, um, but this isn't, this, this candle story isn't in the Rogan interview. So this is really interesting. And this is, again, you know, if you're going to make this up, if you're a physicist, you wouldn't make this up. Okay, because it goes against everything that you think would happen if you kind of bring a candle near, um, you know, kind of gravity, yeah? So take a listen to this. That can change everything we know today, just having a machine to produce artificial gravity. Because look, look at what that does. We know gravity, space, and time are all tied together. There are your shields, like on Star Trek, that, you know, deflect micrometeorites. There is your protection from radiation without heavy shielding. There is something that with an intense enough focused field, you can actually bend space. And there is something that can actually alter the flow of time. I mean, that's the missing piece of pie. Didn't they actually breathe a, a, a candle? A flame for yeah, you. now that's when it was connected to the gravity amplifiers where they could focus it. And uh, that they, was... They froze a candle? Flame. Yeah, they had a they had a candle lit uh, to set it up for you. Um, again, there's a large in the craft itself. There are three long pipes. Um, 
I'd say, uh, well, I don't know about what's that, three, four feet in diameter, maybe f five feet long. Um, anyway, they dangle the three of them at the bottom of the craft. These produce gravitational waves, and they can focus them to a point or spread them apart. Those are um, what you call the wave guys? Yeah, okay. yeah. They're part of the uh, power source control mechanism and the uh, wave, well, the waveguide is what I actually call the interlink between okay. them, but that, that's the gravitational engine. Um, they had one of those devices out along with the subsystem that connects it. So they can produce the power from the reactor, it runs the gravity amplifier, and they can focus and change the gravity beam that comes out of it. They took, a, they were speaking of Barry, took a candle, put it close to the mouth of it, lit it, a normal flickering candle flame, and then activated the reactor. The gravity wave came out as expected, and the candle flame remained luminous and stopped moving. And it's I mean, it's, physics, yeah, right? because the look, if it's going to freeze it, the photon should stop being emitted. If it's going to, you know, change the characteristics, look, how can the combustion continue to take place without the convection inside the flame? Because actually, the reason a flame is elongated is not not really because of heat; it's because of gravity. Because gravity pulls down, and you know, convection moves flames upward. It's why in, in a zero gravity environment, flame is a ball, obviously. There's nothing to pull things around. But anyway, if, uh, look, if you negate the gravity around it, why is it still pointy? How can it still be making light? And why doesn't it move? Well, I mean, he, from what Barry said, it's not just gravity, but this also time lock. You've they distorted froze the, frame of time. yeah, they yeah. It essentially froze a, a piece of time there. And I, you know, what do you say? I mean, you're, it's empirical evidence. You're looking at it. It's not, it's not a, it doesn't make sense that you could see it. And, uh, look, it, it, the stuff I saw there was the most unbelievable, literally, because it, it, it defied what, what we knew as physics. It doesn't make sense. I love the way he says it doesn't make sense. There's, it doesn't make sense. And, um, yeah, no, that reminds me, that thing of, you know, it changes everything. It changes, gravity can change space and time. Reminds me of this thing that Ben Rich, the guy that ran um, Lockheed Martin's skunk works for years, like he supposedly says, and I'll play a little clip in a minute. Um, he supposedly said that, yeah, we, we can, we've got enough technology to send E.T. home. 